Okay, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. And uh, welcome to the research panel on the energy resilience challenge topic. And uh, this is uh, uh, the third webinar that uh, co-hosted by EPRI and the Stanford Bits and Watts and together to discuss the challenges, opportunities on the energy system resilience issue and how the AI can help. And uh, a little bit background, as we uh, are speaking, the electricity sector is going through Titanic shift due to the urgency to decarbonize, improve the resilience against extreme events like what we happened in the last several weeks or the hurricanes in the Southeast area and also provide affordable and equitable access to the at-risk communities. And the traditionally modeling simulation based approach has been used widely by utilities to design the infrastructure. Then we think that AI could be a powerful additional approach be used to analyze large amount data and identify patterns and the trends. And by seeing that over the last 18 months, you know, EPRI uh, launched the AI initiative and been working with Stanford and many other organizations put together a grand challenger AI application for the electricity sectors. And the way identified five ground challenges. And one of them is how the AI can help to address energy resilience issue. And uh, uh, also I'd like to introduce my co-host, Sarah we're from EPRI. Sarah and I have been doing this over the summer. And uh, uh, the beginning of the summer, June 21st, we brought together three US utilities from both West, from West Coast, from East Coast, from Texas, and they shared with us all different kinds of climate-induced vulnerability assessment done at different utilities and how they collect the data and what kind of use case they have been using the AI approach to address the resilience challenges. And uh, a couple of months ago, we invited the two European utilities um, from, uh, from Italy, from Spain uh, and the Portugal discuss uh, you know, how they are using different approach uh, to address the climate resilience challenges. And uh, uh, today, uh, we are very glad to have uh, uh, both EPRI and the Stanford are going to share with the audience the existing research effort going on at these two organizations. And uh, uh, without further ado, so uh, let me do this way. Why not uh, I uh, introduce Alex? Then you can introduce uh, uh, my colleague, Ram. How's that? <laughs> Very good. So uh, we will start with Alex uh, to share with us EPRI's Climate Ready Initiative. And uh, Alex is a CEO Chief of Staff at uh, Electrical Power Research Institute, where he supports the CEO's enterprise strategy and operations. Uh, in addition, uh, over the last six months and a year, Alex is co-lead EPRI's newest strategic initiative called the Climate Ready. We are with the officially launched in April 2022 with the goal of developing a comprehensive and holistic investment framework on climate vulnerability analysis. So with that, I will stop sharing my slides and uh, pass the mic to Alex. Alex. Thank you, Lang. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here today. I appreciate everyone's attention and the opportunity to talk to you guys a little bit about who EPRI is and, and the kind of work we have uh, ongoing. Uh, as Lang said, my name is Alex Summy. I serve as uh, Chief of Staff to our CEO. I'm based out of Charlotte, North Carolina, and I've been with the EPRI team for about 11 years. I have a, a nuclear and, and materials engineering background. Just a quick aside on who EPRI is and what we do, for those of you who may not be as familiar with us, we're a nonprofit independent think tank for the electric power industry. Uh, we're conducting research and advancing technology on every aspect of electricity from the generation of electrons to the transmission and delivery all the way down to the, the end use of electricity. So any and every asset, asset and aspect or facet of the electric uh, utility industry, we, we have some sort of ongoing R&D. And, and ultimately what we're trying to achieve is, is work collaborative, collaboratively to advance and develop the technology and mature it to a point where 
the utilities and, and customers can ultimately apply it uh, in their homes for the benefit of society and for the, for the benefit of the world. Uh, we do, do utilize a collaborative approach. So we, we bring together stakeholders, utilities, vendors, OEMs, consultants, academia, national labs uh, from across, not just here in the US, but, but across the globe uh, with that singular purpose of advancing technology and science. Uh, we represent over 400 global utility members and, and uh, execute roughly 450 million annually in research every year. The most important and, and key takeaway uh, with regards to who EPRI is, is that we are purely an objective science and technology based organization. Uh, we don't advocate policy. We don't, we don't recommend policy. And, and as a result, we believe it gives us a unique and, and really a highly credible position uh, within the industry and within the broader discourse to inform policy making and to inform dialogue with external stakeholders and ultimately inform utility strategy. So all that being said, I will speak a little bit today about Climate Ready, our climate resilience and adaptation initiative. And I promise to only use one slide during this. And, and before I even throw up that slide, I wanna, I wanna set the stage a little bit on the need, the opportunity and, and the uh, barriers that ultimately led us to launching this initiative and, and uh, initiating this work. The need, which, which Lang had uh, alluded to, is really in two parts. The first is around extreme weather. Uh, we are all having this shared lived experience of extreme weather, uh, not just here in the US, but, but really around the globe. And, and we're seeing extreme weather events increase, not just in duration and intensity, but, but also most notably frequency. What was once a one in a thousand or one in a one in a hundred year event is now becoming a one in uh, one in twenty or one in ten year event or, or even more frequent. Uh, you can see this also. We, we an organization that attracts the number of individual billion dollar weather disasters each year just here in the U.S. This has effectively doubled in the past ten years and quadrupled in the past twenty. So there's this uh, this undeniable uh, lived experience. Uh, around extreme weather and the consequences of it. In tandem to this is this rapid decarbonization transition we're all undergoing, which is driving and accelerating the growth of electrification. Society's dependence on electricity for its final energy source is rapidly growing. Uh, it's currently estimated today that roughly 20% of our final energy use is, is uh, from electricity. That's expected to double or even triple uh, by 2050. So we already have this exceptionally high bar for reliability and resilience, and it's only going to uh, grow even higher. And not only do we have to maintain it, but we have to improve upon it as society becomes more and more dependent on electricity. Uh, you know, examples of this are stuff that you're seeing customers, uh, you, you, uh, customers have in their homes, electric heat pumps, water heaters, cooking appliances. And then of course, you can't say electrification without commenting on electric vehicles. Just over in California, where, where Liang is, is right now, they've uh, recently passed a law saying by 2035, all new, electric, all new vehicles have to be electric. So it, it really, uh, I think, puts a fine point on the need here, both from an extreme weather um, point of view and then also from society's growing dependence on electricity. So, you know, taking a, a positive look on this, it's, it's, not, all, it's not all bad or sad. It's, there's, it, with need comes opportunity opportunity for change, opportunity for advancement and development. And our opportunity here is really rooted in science and technology, as, as I would argue most opportunity is as, a, as an engineer. <laughs> our uh, climate science, our modeling tools, our capabilities, they have advanced and they matured to a point where we can start having meaningful conversations and projecting out what does the climate look like in 10 years, in 20 years, in 30 years, and how does that climate, the, these fundamental variables, translate into the probability of extreme weather events? And what these tools and what these insights do is they ultimately enable us to take a fundamentally different approach to resilience. This different approach is going from a reactive to a proactive thought process around how we invest in resilience in the electrical grid. So if, if you think about it historically, uh, some would argue that the that the utility industry has been uh, gotten quite good and fairly effective at a reactive approach to resilience. Uh, and I'll give an example: when when Hurricane Harvey hit the uh, hit the Texas coastline in the Gulf several years back, it it uh, caused significant flooding in a number of areas that they really hadn't seen it. And the the local utility came in and spent 
half a billion dollars to elevate critical infrastructure to ward off uh, future flooding events in that area. And that's good, and, and that is a success in, in some regards in the, in the fact that we were responsive to the event. But what we ultimately need to do, recognizing that, that climate, climate change and the, um, uh, these new extreme events are, are becoming a reality that we're living in, we need to adopt a, a proactive footing towards resilience investment. We need to, and we can, with these new tools and methodologies, anticipate these new extreme events and, and these untested vulnerabilities uh, within our or on our electric grid. Uh, one study I saw that I, I think really puts it in, into perspective is that it, it estimated that transmission and distribution infrastructure owners would save roughly 2.5 billion, that's billion with a B, annually, every year by the end of the century, simply if they use projected climate data to inform their design standards instead of historical climate data. So if that's not you know, strong enough uh, quantifiable justification, I'm not sure what would be. There's, there's other studies that point to similar quantifiable impacts of us adopting a proactive approach towards resilience investment. Not only does it have this uh, fiscal impact, it has a direct impact obviously on the uh, communities and society itself. The, the consequences of losing electricity, as I, as I mentioned earlier, is becoming more and more dire and more and more severe. So there's a, there's a quantifiable and, a, and then a qualitative uh, reason to be, to be exploring these, uh, these options and these solutions. So we've got these clear needs. Uh, we have a defined opportunity based on the science and technology cap capabilities open to us. What are the barriers? What's holding us back? And this really gets to the crux of why EPRI has launched Climate Ready is to address these barriers. The, the first one is, is the approach. The approach right now is bespoke and inconsistent. We have uh, universities, national labs, consultants, R&D organizations like EPRI across the US and across the globe, all providing their own um, unique and custom analysis and, and methodology towards projection and then downscaling and localizing of climate data and then applying it to individual assets. It's not to say that any one of these methods is right or wrong. It's, they all have their pros and cons. They all have fundamental value to add to the equation. But we need to set some ground rules. We need to provide some, some guardrails, you might say, some uh, consistency around the fundamental assumptions that we applied so that we as a group, when we talk about this and we talk about it with external stakeholders, we're all seeing it from the same, same sheet of notes, so to speak. And we all have a, a similar um, understanding, base understanding to guide the conversation and the discussion. Hand in hand with that inconsistent approach, the other key barrier is simply the lack of transparency. Uh, be, because there's this bespoke and, and individual approach across the board, uh, there's often a lack of transparency. And so you have uh, utilities and, and other key um, operators and owners trying to make informed and justified resilience investment strategies. And they're getting just as, just as viable and just as justified questions from key stakeholders, from regulators, from others around, have you benchmarked this? What's your maturity right now? Have you thought about these other tools and these other options that are out there? And so this, all, this, all this talk and all this, um, you know, these, these needs, this opportunity, and then these barriers ultimately leads us to this, uh, this new initiative that we've launched back in April. So I'm sharing my slide. Ho hopefully everybody can see it here. It's called Climate Ready. Ready is an acronym with an I, stands for Resilience and Adaptation Initiative. And what Climate Ready is seeking to do is ultimately provide a framework that points to the landscape of tools and capabilities that is out there and provides a step-by-step -step sort of how-to guidance document for our industry to coalesce around an approach to ultimately assess vulnerability to our assets and to our system and then make informed and uh, most cost-effective decisions around the mitigation and adaptation strategies that can be applied. So within this initiative, which, uh, as I think I mentioned, kicked off in April of this year, we have split the work out into three uh, distinct work streams. These are not happening in serial. These are happening in parallel and iterative with the, iter iteratively with each other as they inform one another. The first one is all around the climate data science and modeling itself. It's, it's around uh, identifying what data is out there, what's the suitability of that data. If you're looking at wind speeds uh, for your wind turbines, well, you care about it 
at uh, 10 or 20 meters, not at two or five meters. So the applicability of climate data, what's the suitability of it, and uh, what are the gaps of it uh, for, for your particular region is, uh, is, a, is a critical uh, part of the equation. Once you've projected out and you've assessed what the quality of data is and what you, what you can and cannot um, infer from it, that's when you, you jump over to Workstream 2 and you can begin to assess what is the vulnerability and what is the risk on specific assets uh, within your system. And then based on that vulnerability and that risk, what are the mitigation options? What are they, what is the suite of adaptation strategies that are out there? Uh, and so you can lay them out side by side and begin to compare uh, which ones are gonna be the most uh, effective for you and most relevant for your situation. And then what are some of the you know, design criteria you should be, one, one should be planning for as they think about their system operating in the, the weather of the future 20, 30, 40 years from now. All this bubbles up into Workstream 3, where we, we take this information, these knowledge blocks, if you will, and we build out a system level perspective around the vulnerability and around the adaptation and mitigation solutions so that ultimately at the end of the day, a utility is able to provide, do a risk-informed, probabilistic uh, cost-benefit analysis on all of the solutions and come, come to a, a, some sort of consensus and agreement around what's going to be the best approach and then, ha and, and then have a uh, informed and um, uh, much more efficient conversation with external stakeholders uh, to, to help um, bring that adaptation strategy out into the, the public side. So we, uh, we envision, uh, this is a three-year initiative, we envision it culminating with this framework that I've described. It's not a prescriptive framework. It's not picking winners and losers. It's pointing to all of the options out there and highlighting their capabilities along with their pros and cons. Along the way, we'll be coming out, we'll be providing a number of deep dive technical assessments, briefings, informing the public discourse in this area, providing a network of um, a peer network for the industry and external stakeholders to engage and talk to each other. And, uh, and, the, and then there's three sort of key tenets associated with Climate Ready that I think are, is important to highlight here. One is this framework needs to be comprehensive. It needs to include all of the different asset types. So uh, generating electricity, transmission and delivery of electricity, down to end use, the electrification I talked about, plus uh, uh, some consideration for uh, equity, environmental justice, and other community priorities that might be of importance in a particular area. So it needs to be comprehensive in terms of the assets, it needs to be comprehensive in terms of the weather variables and the weather, excuse me, the climate variables and the weather events that need to be considered. And then comprehensive in terms of the utility activities. This is looking at planning through operations and maintenance uh, of the electric grid. It needs to be consistent. And I say this also recognizing it needs to be flexible. This is a, 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 a big problem, but it has uh, hyper-local uh, solutions. Everyone's situation is unique and different, but we need to be able to leverage a framework that consistently brings us to similar solutions or at least has the same assumptions built in so that when we talk and we benchmark and we attempt to do some sort of um, you know, peer maturity um, modeling, we, we are, uh, we're doing an apples to apples comparison. Last, and I would argue probably the most important aspect of this entire initiative is that it needs to be collaborative. I talked earlier about everyone taking their own approach and the lack of transparency behind these approaches. What Climate Ready is doing is convening a uh, stake of a, what we're calling affinity group members, really external stakeholders. Uh, this includes regulators, this includes government organizations, national labs, DOE, uh, this includes academia, this includes consultants, OEMs, financial and insurance organizations. We wanna bring everyone and anyone who has a stake in this, in this discussion to the table to provide perspective, to point to solutions and methodologies that they're aware of, and to ultimately incorporate their thoughts and ideas into the broader framework. So that at the end of the day, when a utility leverages the framework, there is a fundamental level of, if not consensus, at least agreement on the baseline assumptions that go into the conversation. So all, all that to be, to be said, uh, we're very excited about the initiative. We've had uh, significant success, success so far in terms of participation and engagement. We have uh, 33 utility members that have signed up for it with many more ongoing conversations. We have dozens of external stakeholders uh, participating in the effort. We are uh, 
having our first in-person workshop next week in New Mexico. So, um, yeah, I think that's, that's Liang, I'll probably pause here and open up the questions, but I would encourage everyone and anyone on the phone that if you have interest and you want to participate in this initiative, please uh, reach out to us and we very much welcome your engagement. Wonderful, Alex. Thank you very much. A uh, lot of information here. Then um, I think we are a little bit behind the schedule, so let's move on. I will have uh, Sarah to introduce uh, another panelist here. We are honored to have, in addition to Alex, Professor Ram Rajak. Roger Gopal with us today. He is an associate professor of civil and environmental engineering at Stanford and the co-director of Stanford's Fitz and Watts Initiative. He directs Stan the Stanford Sustainable Systems Lab focused on large-scale monitoring, data analytics, and stochastic control for infrastructure networks. And in particular, and what we're focused on here today, um, looking at power networks, renewables integration, smart distribution systems, demand side data analytics, R&D. Um, he holds more than 30 patents, several best paper, paper awards, and has advised or founded various companies along the same lines in power network R&D. Thank you for jo joining us today, Ram, and please go ahead and get started. Yeah, uh, thank you so much for inviting me for this session. And uh, I just have a few slides to, to share um, and, and go quickly based on um, an ongoing project we have here at Stanford, but that illustrates kind of the value of AI in this uh, conversation about resiliency. So here's the team for a project, which uh, if you look across, it covers many different areas and backgrounds and uh, the faculty are listed below here. Um, you know, everyone was aware of the Texas power crisis and it, it was one of these uh, big uh, climate uh, related grid events that we have had recently. And the number that I really wanted to focus on was the kind of the human impact of this event, you know, 70 deaths, 5 million people without power, 12 million people with water shortages. And if you look here at the outage map of Houston, you can notice that a lot of the areas where power was cut off were of those most vulnerable people, the low and, and, and middle income folks that, that really don't have any alternatives of where to go and so on. And in terms of damage, it, it was a huge issue. So one of the questions that, that we started out here in the campus was, well, in order to help utilities and the rest of the ecosystem to address this, kind of what do we need to do to be prepared for the next time? Exactly like Alex was describing. Um, and our kind of approach though, since we, we, we have the, the benefit of, of being uh, uh, in, in uh, academia was may, maybe let's start from kind of the bottom up. And when you do that, you know, we said, well, we know that the energy system will need to be decarbonized. And what we are asking is for it to be resilient to climate change and extreme events. That's great. But the one aspect that is very key is that it needs to serve everyone. And it needs to be aware of how it impacts people and communities. So rather than taking a infrastructure centered approach, how do we take a community centered approach in order to um, better manage our system resiliency as well as decarbonization? So typically the way we have designed infrastructure is we look at the aggregate of the demand, we predict the demand and when we, we say we, we build the sufficient infrastructure capacity to satisfy that. Uh, but by looking at the average demand, when it comes time to do resiliency and things like that, we don't really know how it is individually impacting different people and different communities. And uh, in consequently, you know, the, the kind of human impact and, and, and costs that we saw before. So how do we start moving towards a design that's much more people and community centered? To do that, we first need to establish metrics. And we thought of four very high level areas where we need metrics. So the first, you know, they're shown here. Um, first, of course, we want the system to be equitable, meaning 
Um, if you're going to have any sort of uh, uh, resiliency to climate in the system, it should be distributed equally among all uh, everyone. Second, it should be inexpensive, but we need to also define what inexpensive and equitable mean. Um, you know, some more recent definitions of grid cost are urging for us to consider cost as a percentage of people's income. That's not how traditionally we have looked at that. Third, we want the grid to be resilient, um, as Alex uh, pointed out, particularly to these uh, new classes of events, the climate-induced um, grid events. And finally, we want it to be 24-7 carbon-free. Um, so we started from this big picture you know, vision and said, OK, what is needed if we were to try to do this in practice? Well, in order to design such a grid, you need to take certain steps. The first one is if we want to build that resiliency, we need to be able to map the climate risks at the level of communities, not at the aggregate level, not at the level of the infrastructure alone, but also at the level of communities. And how do we do that in a scalable way? Uh, so there is a lot of work in the climate science community, but typically the information they produce um, is not necessarily the information you need when you're ca calculating kind of impacts on people uh, through, you know, other infrastructure, you know, be it electricity or gas. Uh, the second thing you need to do is then take these inputs of these climate uh, risks and transform them into climate infra induced infrastructure vulnerability on a community basis. So I can take a census tract in California and say things like, you know, this is how likely you are to have an outage during, you know, these type of situations. Um, this is how much uh, extra demand you will have when, when you see a heat wave and so on and so forth. So, you know, doing that connection at a very granular level is very important and, and how to do that. And finally, uh, in order to kind of uh, mitigate the impacts of these climate events, we focused on the idea of adaptation or preparation. Uh, of course, there, there's a lot of other steps in, in, in even during the event while it's happening and then you know, a post event and so on and so forth. But the question we had is, what are approaches for a more equitable infrastructure adaptation? Because typically as we look at the infrastructure adaptation in the grid, it's focused again on average performance metrics across the whole footprint of the grid. And behind that, you can actually hide a lot of these uh, nuances of local populations, their needs and the impacts they might have. Um, and uh, we also made it a priority that anything we do in this kind of project we have out here um, is shared in the open through the Energy Data Commons. Um, and we are also partnering with various organizations, including uh, EPRI, uh, to do this. So to test these steps here and actually come up with some concrete ideas, we decided to look initially on extreme temperature events because those are the best understood ones according to climate modeling, um, as well as wildfires. And I'll just show you some motifs that came out of our research and, and then we can have a discussion. I'm just going to click through these so you can see the slides later. Um, the first one is we try to map kind of what is the risk of having a very hot or extremely hot day according to temperature and humidity happening in any given location in a map in California, for example. And typically there's two ways to do this. One is you do take station measurements information and do some sort of local interpolation based on the historical patterns and try to say what's that temperature. The other one is through the reanalysis of satellite um, extrapolated data. So you use uh, weather models and so on. They are at a much coarser spatial level. Um, and then to make it granular, you use reanalysis to do that. And there is this very nice uh, report uh, listed in the, in the bottom of the slide here on the, uh, uh, that shows that if I look at you know, a certain percentile of the temperature on a particular location, there could be a difference of three to six degrees centigrade, depending on which percentile, 95th or 99th percentile, depending on the method you used. 
So what should you do? So we start with that question um, and you know, we, we try to understand, okay, maybe the, the right thing to do with risks is to kind of fit tail probabilities. The difficulty of fitting tail probabilities is you don't have a lot of extreme data points. And so can you combine the principles of some climate science and, and statistics in order to do that? And one methodology is to use clustering and we identified these bands where weather behaves similarly throughout history. And now I take the data across those bands and build tail probabilities for that. And that allows me to calculate these uh, you know, risks in, in a stationary 100 year level event uh, for a period in the future. Now, um, all, of, all of this you know, shows the importance of knowing what data sources you have and then producing predictions that are appropriate for the application you wanna have. Um, and the benefits of combining data with some sort of weather models. Um, we also have been uh, using AI to try to do temperature distributions that are hourly so that you get the actual temperature during the day, which is very important to analyze anything to do with electricity because um, demand and planning depend on hourly demand. Uh, sorry, uh, planning depends on the hourly demand. And um, our conclusion is that uh, you, you can build methods of this type. Uh, the next thing I wanted to skip to is now I wanna take this extreme weather events and then project them into impacts on the infrastructure. Um, one class of things that, that one can develop is for example, how does the actual electricity consumption responds to changes in temperature and uh, then project that with respect to climate, like Alex was saying. And the trick to do that is really to understand your past very well and build a model of your past and then take a moment where you have a change and say, I'm gonna use the model of my past to say, that's how I should have behaved. And then you can take the difference with respect to that. And when you do this kind of analysis, one of the things that we learned is that Identifying the right metrics for comparisons is very important. So in a particular demand study, we looked at, for example, how much extra CO2 emissions will be caused by the growth in demand due to climate risks and climate change. Um, and we also have looked at, you know, during heat waves, for example, how much additional demand is, re is required in different counties or zip codes in California for residential consumers and for uh, small and medium businesses. And it's, it, it can be uh, quite a lot. I mean, between 20 and 40%, um, it also leads to a lot of adoption of uh, air conditioning. And again, this increase is not really equitable. So whenever we do these analysis, we also looked at the distribution of the impacts across the population. Um, and uh, the last thing that we're doing is we're kind of collecting a lot of data from utilities, both taking uh, existing data that's reported um, and collected by the federal government and then combining with data that is provided to us when we write to utilities so that we can build an outage model that would allow us to calculate the risk of outage due to climate events in any location in the United States. And when I say location, we are thinking about census tracts eventually. Um, and so right now we have collected data from about 1,102 electric utilities um, in almost uh, all states and covering almost all counties in the US. We now correlate that information with the extreme weather database from the US, the shell this data. And this is another important insight about applying AI and using this information. Electric utilities report together with their outage information, which type of uh, event caused that outage. So it could be, you know, uh, an extreme, you know, uh, hurricane or something like that. But what we learned was there is also um, what climate scientists consider extreme events. And that's actually a larger set than what utilities consider to be extreme weather events. So taking the climate science definition and applying it here, you can start to build these models that explain reliability. And it's very, very interesting. 
Um, this is still uh, ongoing work, but some early insights are that, of course, uh, investments on the distribution network pay off and they certainly uh, reduce your safety and safety due to extreme weather events. Uh, but, uh, for example, if you have a lot of uh, wind and solar in your footprint, that actually makes you a little bit more sensitive to, to extreme weather events. And you have to think about how, how to contract that. Um, but hopefully we will be able to do more of these models, particularly uh, partnering with uh, many who are attending the webinar today. And the last thing I wanted to share was about adaptation. And the, the first thing we did in adaptation was we, we took one particular case study. We wanted to understand um, how can we adapt the urban grids to with respect to wildfires? And the challenge in doing that is like, we wanted to know, okay, what is it beneficial to do? Should I do vegetation management? Should I replace wooden poles by metal poles? Should I underground the lines? Well, the challenge is a lot of this information is not publicly available. Uh, particularly, for example, in California, we don't know the undergrounding status of the distribution lines. That's uh, data that is owned by the utility. So what we did was we, we used Google Street View information and we used computer vision to kind of map which lines are overground, which lines are underground. We correlated that with the existing publicly available maps for the distribution grids in California for SCE and PG&E. Um, and then we combined the, so, so that allowed us to calculate an undergrounding rate per census tract in these, you know, Northern California and Southern California census tracts. And then we combined that information with other sources of information. Uh, Cal Fire publishes a fire risk map, which is their annual wildfire probability prediction over a certain period of time. So we can compare that to where the, you know, the undergrounding rates that we obtain. So undergrounding rate means what is the fraction of miles of your distribution lines that are underground? Okay. Uh, we use three canopy cover data that's published um, as well, and we can then compute the canopy cover and how close it is to the distribution line. Uh, so that gives you an idea, high level idea of vegetation risk. And then based on a particular data set provided by PG&E uh, last year to the public, we were able to also look at the asset risks on poles and transformers and so on. So let me show you what this uncovered, which is really interesting. The first thing is that vulnerability of the grid is not equitable. So if you look at undergrounding rates, that's the first figure here, and I stratify it according to wildfire risk, um, you can see that undergrounding is always lower for lower income community census tracts, so the fraction of lines underground. And particularly if I look at high wildfire risk, and that is definitely true. Now, this is obviously not meant to be done in purpose, but this is the result of us using tools for planning that look at things in the aggregate. Um, the second thing that we learned is, for example, if you look at the fraction of overhead lines that overlap with the tree cover within 10 meters, um, you can see that again, um, it is much higher for uh, low and uh, middle income communities. And uh, similarly, if I look at transformers and their ages, you know, the transformers tend to be much older in low and in middle income community regions. And finally, the same for wood poles. And so what, what we saw was, well, there is this issue happening of, of, of the, the of more exposure to risk for low and middle income communities. And so how do you go about fixing it? So we worked with a, a policy expert here on campus, uh, Michael Wara. He, he also writes a lot of, about wildfires. And the idea that we had is really, you know, the most effective, one of the most effective mechanisms is line undergrounding. Of course, you can't underground all the lines. So we used an algorithm to determine where are the critical lines that need to be underground. Um, once we had that, then we had to figure out how to make the costs of this more equitable. And we use a definition from equity that has been uh, proposed 
um, in, in the last five years by Severin Bornstein from, from Berkeley that says, well, we should start looking at these costs as a fraction of income. So we wanted to make sure that the increase of what you pay for electricity as a fraction of your income remains the same no matter where you are. And the method then is pretty simple. You look at the census tracts where you have to bury lines. If you are below a certain income uh, cutoff, you're gonna use a general cost sharing mechanism. If you are um, above that cutoff, then just the local community shares the cost for that upgrade. And that basically equates and makes it much more flat, you know, the, the percentage increase of, of uh, uh, everyone's bill. Um, the next thing that we're trying to do now, so, so this shows, you know, the way we think about the solutions need to change if you're going to incorporate the impact on the population and this issue of equity. The next thing that we are doing is also looking at DRs. So that's kind of our lab's um, main focus along the years have been distributed energy resources and how to integrate them to the grid and provide support in various ways. Uh, but one area that, that we are looking at now is if I want to have resiliency using DRs, what should I do? And so we set, we took data that's available for basically across the US, you know, both residential and uh, commercial data. Um, and we were able to take uh, utility rates in all these different regions and different costs of installation and everything and optimize a mix of diesel, batteries, storage, and PV. So this is preliminary work. We're also incorporating now uh, a natural gas genset uh, and see what is the optimal mix that a customer would have that's lowest cost, uh, given that he has the goal to have a certain reliability level, a certain uh, likelihood of outage, given the local expected outage rates based on our previous model that I just discussed. And uh, one of the key findings is that, uh, of course, with the cost of what technologies are today, you use a lot of diesel, um, but there is regions where you have a lot of adoption of solar and battery. Uh, and there is about, I think, 10% of the census tracts where you see um, a substantial number of consumers basically uh, having more than 80% of their consumption being self-produced. And if you advance this model using all the NREL projections for costs of different technologies, uh, what we found is that um, actually can uh, grow and, and about 30% of all, all of these census tracts will, will have that. So uh, just a different view to resiliency and more bottom up. So thank you very much and um, would love to. Very good. Then let's bring both uh, uh, Sarah and Alex back to the stage. And um, uh, for all the audience online, I would encourage you to you know, type your question on the Q&A. I do see uh, two excellent questions there, and we're going to address them later. But the first, I think uh, both Ram and uh, Alex, you mentioned Ram, you talk about a lot on the community resilience solution. And Alex, you touch a little bit on the, the environmental justice and equity will be very important part for APRI's design of this investment framework. So the question is how can AI, you know, data analytics approach to really bring this uh, EJ and uh, energy equity issue from just a concept to reality? Because from my perspective, I'm relatively new to the EJ and energy equity area. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm learning a lot recently by talking to my colleagues here. And also, you know, from Ram's example is uh, there's a lot of public available social behavior, social science data, like the income and the race, you know, from the census data, how this data can be leveraged to help utility make, a, make the investment decision. So probably I think let's, Alex, you go first, then Ram can chime in later. How's that, Alex? Great question. And I'll confess to I'm I'm in the same boat as you. I'm learning a lot about EJ and equity from my uh, friends and peers here at EPRI. It's a, it's a fascinating topic and it's, it's tough, especially for, for engineers because it's so uh, qualitative and, and, and kind of squishy and subjective sometimes. That's not to say that it isn't just as incredibly important, but it's, uh, it's not, as, not as black and white as, as we might be uh, used to. The, I, I think my, 
my initial thoughts here would be around the social science data itself and how AI can, can fill in some of the gaps and provide more granularity and depth around that data, particularly from a, a locational point of view. Ram touched on in the beginning of his presentation around the number of uh, vulnerable and disadvantaged communities that were impacted by power outages or power disruptions. And, um, and so being able to understand where these communities are can directly translate into the types of resilient solutions that are going to be most cost effective and useful for them, whether that is undergrounding, whether that's microgrid, whether that's uh, putting in more feeders or, or, or uh, changing the type of distribution pool that you're using or simply vegetation management. You know, all these different solutions can be viable and, and each one's going to be different depending on the unique characteristics of their location. But I think it's important for us to in inject within the conversation this fundamental understanding. And, and Ram, you, you really did, I think, highlight, uh, highlight it well, that the, um, the, the impact to a disadvantaged community with a power disruption is, is massively more significant than to an effluent community. I would be so bold as to say most of the people on the phone here today can lose power for a day or two. We could lose all the food in our fridge and and we could you know jump in our Range Rover and drive 300 miles to go stay in a hotel where they do have power. It would be inconvenient. We wouldn't like it, but we would be fine. We would be able to move on and continue on with with our daily lives. That's not the case for these disadvantaged communities. Losing a fridge full of food for them can have a significant impact on their bottom line. They can't just pack up everybody in their family and go to afford to to go to a hotel. So. The extent to which uh, AI can, can help us leverage the social science data from a locational point of view and inform uh, our understanding of the location of these vulnerable communities, and then also help us uh, prioritize some of the um, response strategies when there is an outage. I think that's another important part of this too. It's we're, we're not gonna be fail safe necessarily all the time, but, but, but safe fail is maybe a better way of thinking about it. Sometimes it's gonna be more cost effective and more appropriate to recognize there will be failures on the grid, and we're going to design a, a response around those or anticipate them in a way that uh, allows us to bring power back in a, in a faster and more effective way. So, um, you know, traditionally we look at feeders and prioritizing feeders back just on number of customers, but uh, with this sort of data, we could instead overlay the types of customers and the severity of impact to them on which uh, which feeders we necessarily you know prioritize and coming back from from some sort of outage. I uh, agree with what uh, Alex said, and maybe just summarizing and, and, and emphasizing a couple of his points. Um, the first thing is you, you need to define which metrics you want to compute that capture um, these notions of, of equity and, and uh, environmental justice and impact. Um, the, when you're defining these things, you know, part of it is being able to compute them at scale across uh, your entire footprint. Um, the other part is, uh, you know, the, they need to be metrics that you can eventually actually, uh, in, you know, take actions upon them, and meaning you can incorporate them in some planning and optimization. And that's another place where I think AI in the near future will be very helpful as we start to optimize with the goal of um, incorporating these metrics as, a, as an objective function. Um, the other aspect that I think is, is very important when, when dealing with uh, this issue of social justice and equity and so on is the ability to access data openly. I think part of uh, understanding equity is you need real, the real granularity on, on what's happening. And that means you need data. So that's been one of the challenges we've faced when trying to do that. And I think uh, this data is not just sitting at any one entity. So there will have to be a lot of coordination across many entities in the grid to, and, and outside of the grid as well, you know, building information and cities and all of that to, to provide the information. Great, thank you for those responses. And we're going to move on to a second question. When we think about the challenges of integrating AI into systems and businesses, what are the key challenges that you both see in integrating AI into your practices? And we, we may start with, with, with Professor Roger Gopal while you're up on 
Sure. Um, key challenges that we see in using AI, I think, is the availability of high quality labeled data. So sometimes you have no data available, then sometimes you get some data, but the data doesn't have the appropriate information you need to build your AI models. And we spend a lot of time basically um, doing that, you know, uh, adding that to the data. Just so you have an idea in all of these projects I shared today, maybe 90% of the time was spent on kind of finding, organizing, labeling the data. Um, I would say that is the biggest challenge. Um, and and uh, I think a second but smaller challenge has been uh, around uh, access to um, the you know different pieces of information uh, that are disparate uh, and putting them all together. Um, Excellent. I would agree. Yeah, go ahead. I was to say I agree wholeheartedly with with uh, Ram's points there, and I, and I might build a little bit off of your point around the data format itself. Uh, one of the things that we're going to be trying to do within the climate ready framework is uh, take the downstream needs and data requirements and provide those to the data generators themselves. Uh, it's going to be slow and painful, and there's going to be iteration involved, inevitable iteration on the uh, the data requirements and, and getting them to the place we need but we can at least short circuit some of it by taking a bit more of a proactive approach and identifying uh, and understanding better how the data is being used and, and what the data needs are and then informing the the data generators on on how to implement those the um and so that's that's something we'll be doing within the climate ready framework itself that we'll be we'll be trying to advance that conversation the other aspect you mentioned too around data access, I, I would build upon that in terms of data privacy and data security, owning the rights to use the data and then aggregating it in a way that maintains anonymity is, is not trivial. And then throw on top of that, this massive requirements growing around cybersecurity. I don't know how much you guys are seeing it in your world, but in our world, almost every facet of our business now is having its own individualized and unique requirements for cybersecurity that are becoming really quite paralyzing and burdensome. And that's not to trivialize their necessity. They're absolutely, it's, it's absolutely very much required, but seeing us as an industry and a society rally around some sort of standardization for cybersecurity data requirements would, uh, I think, really open up the floodgates and, and enable us to be much more efficient. Excellent. Yang, I'm going to pass through one of the questions that we had come through chat. We had a link shared with us by Craig Lewis, an article about a market mechanism for financing community microgrids, namely a resilience energy subscription, RES, a straightforward approach. And I think this goes to consistency of approaches, ability to provide transparency, defensible decisions, more easily defensible. And the question from Craig is why not simply prioritize resilience based on the type of facility with consistent application across all communities. And Alex, if you care to provide any comments. Yeah, yeah and I, it's an interesting article, Craig, and I, I did note that, and I'm going to read into it in depth a little bit more to better understand the premise there. I, I guess my immediate reaction is it's, you know, microgrid's not always going to be the most cost effective or, um, you know, a really reasonable uh, solution for for built for providing resilience. It's certainly one of the options, but there might be simpler and more cost-effective options out there. So I would want to uh, better understand the context of when this would. Maybe this is after you've already identified that microgrid is definitively the best solution. Then you can uh, provide some sort of community uh, financing, which sounds like a really interesting idea. I appreciate you sharing the article, and we'll be uh, looking at it in the context of our, our climate-ready effort. I just wanted to add that uh, when most of the analysis I've seen and even the ones we are doing out here at Stanford, uh, they do take into account the uh, load prioritization um, and uh, the different uh, levels of importance and different types of loads. Um, in terms of solutions, um, I do agree there is a diversity of solutions, but one of the things that will impact which ones get adopted is going to be the speed and the scale at which we can deploy things. And uh, for example, what we see in California is I, I talked to, to several friends that have been subject to outage and if they have enough wealth, they go and buy a natural gas 
little gen set, then they have their solution right there. Uh, it doesn't really matter. It's way more expensive than the grid power for them. Uh, so I think, uh, how do you incorporate these kind of concepts in your picture, in your planning picture? I think this is a new type of challenge for power systems, and, and it's super exciting to, 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 to figure this out, you know, bring ideas from, from uh, public policy, sociology, and so on and so forth into this mix here. Okay, very good. Uh, we have only have two minutes left and have a, uh, still have a couple of questions uh, in the queue. So let me pick one of them. I think uh, it's an excellent question and uh, from uh, Lawrence Garwin. And it's a long question. Let me go to the point specifically. So talk about bi-direction EV charging. So are you are you electrical public utility commission and the utility fact in the imminent bi-direction EV charging into their infrastructure planning. And uh, with the background on the electrification transportation side, electrification building side, you know, when to charge the car. And I also want to add whether or not the, the EV itself can be utilized as a resilient solution for the homeowner. I will open the floor. Anyway, anyone want to go first? Ram, Alex? I was going to say that Alex is is you know working with all of the utilities at Apri, so um, I just thought to, you could say something could, on that. I could take a stab. Yeah, I, I, there's certainly awareness and there's a lot of discussion around this uh, this opportunity here. It is a uh, it is not trivial. It, it, the the market design required, the technology required, just in terms of the communication with the grid. Um, it's it's going to be it's it's a big problem, and it's uh, I'll just say this I, I don't want to be too too negative. There's awareness of it, and we are um, there's not just awareness, but there's a sense of urgency because it's it's obvious that adoption of electric vehicles is only going to be exponentially increasing, and it's clear that there's some type of opportunity here. How we execute on it and how we get over some of the hurdles with the different uh, manufacturers and uh, they all have their own unique approach they want to utilize. I saw GM make an announcement recently that they wanted to challenge Tesla and and um, you know providing energy store energy back to the grid in in some regards. It's um it's it's not going to be easy. I think one of the areas where we have started to play around and do some demonstration where it, it can potentially be the first. First area we kind of adopt this sort of thinking would be around fleets and electric buses, for example, where they have these particularly large energy storage capacities, and there's these highly defined times when the buses are being used and not being used. So those might be some of the earlier adopters or at least testers of this type of philosophy. Yeah, I, I just uh, wanted to add um, to to what Alex said. I think when you are considering um, particularly vehicle to grid. Um, one has to remember that these technologies are quite expensive. Um, many of the homes require additional things like, you know, panel replacements and so on to, to, to support this. So there will be issues around the equity of and, and the availability of that because a person has to have an electric vehicle and the infrastructure to, to uh, uh, connect back to the grid. In terms of the one-way charging and kind of alignment of solar, which is kind of what's also commented on on that uh, question, um, Liang and I just had a study that came out that shows that definitely, uh, you know, putting emphasis on daytime charging is a good thing, and that it's a very simple way to kind of increase the uh, lower the, the the cost of of adaptation on the grid. Um, but I think one question that's left open is, does this also increase resiliency? Um, intuitively, the response seems to be yes, but that's a study that, that we will have to carry out to, to see if it's true. Excellent. And a really great way to end this webcast, because if we talk about the most challenging of the biggest challenges, um, just all kinds of great, interesting stuff for us to be digging into um, and great places to start. So I want to thank everybody who was able to join us today for the webcast. And in particular, thank you to Alex and Ram for sharing with us your experience and also um, closing out our webcast for the year. 
We will plan to send a follow-up email that gathers all of the uh, diverse and distributed resources from our webcast to share those. And um, we thank you very much again and look forward to seeing you as we move this work forward. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you.